The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next, Beth Moore warns us about clinging to the wrong things. A couple of months ago, the cat wandered in the house with something grotesque in its jaws. She couldn't tell if it was dead or alive. And so she went over to try and she was going, ee, 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 trying to pull it out of the cat's jaws because it was literally, look what the cat dragged in. Stay tuned to discover what the cat dragged in. Oh, it's a privilege. Thank you. And all of you, I'm James Robinson. Betty and I welcome you. And I'm looking here at the cover of a book titled The God of All Creation, Life Lessons from Pets and Wildlife. And on the cover is uh, a little black dachshund. And I really, we will perhaps bring Princess up here. Now, the problem with Princess is she's the number one church greeter. She just loves everybody. <laughs> and she just really loves everybody. And I'd like you to know her, but this little dachshund, has taught us so much about God and then observing what God created. Beth Moore says, I love that James did this book. Of course, Beth loves dogs, <laughs> and, but she loves the stories, as do every person who's read them and uh, children. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Josh and Katie Hamilton said that they, they not only did they love it, he's a great baseball player, but their girls loved it, and uh, that's what we believe you, you will love it. It's in the bookstores, but we're actually giving it to every one of you who will help us literally give some food to a hungry child, and we'll just say thank you because you'll give them life. Well, Beth Moore is teaching today, and, and she's teaching. It's a kind of a very interesting title, Begging for Something, and of course, She's going to reference the fact people are begging for life and for food, but begging for something. Let, let's let Beth talk to us. Would you welcome Beth Moore? Here's Beth. I, I, I got to tell you something. A buddy of mine sent me a note. I think it was within uh, a package that she was sending that had a T-shirt in it, something she wanted to share with me. But a good buddy of mine back in Houston by the name of Sue, uh, she sent me a note. It was kind of it was kind of random but fun because she's kind of random and fun, and I love that about her. And she said she writes me a little note here, and she says that she had been recently to a, a hospital convention because she works for a hospital and had been to their an annual convention, and they had a really great speaker. And she said that the speaker uh, got up and began to talk about how we will die, at least inside, if we cease to change. That we've got to be people, if we're going to grow as people, and she wasn't really speaking in a spiritual context, but we know, we know that it's even more true according to the Word of God. The whole idea of repentance, that word metanao in the uh, Greek language means to change one's mind, to, to turn and to become different. So we know it's strategic uh, to our faith. But this speaker was talking on more of a, a secular or psychological uh, kind of, of an input. And so she says to them, she says, I want you all to stand to your feet. And she said, what are five things you could change on your person right now? And she says, go. And so they were all kind of looking around, trying to figure out what they were supposed to do. And so, so my friend Sue says, she says, so she says, what are five things on your person you can change instantly? So my friend Sue, she, she names them out. She says, number one, I changed my hair. So she had her hair uh, back in a clip. She takes the clip out. She changed her hair. She took off her name tag. Three, she took off her shoes. Four, she unbuttoned her top button. Five, she just put whatever. I want you to understand what, a, what an obsessive thinker I am. It has driven me crazy that she didn't give me five. Because 
I want to know what the fifth thing was. Don't give me one through four. I mean, either tell me that you changed a lot of things or give me five, but don't give me one through four and then go whatever on number five. What was number five? So I, I've thought about it and thought about it. what could it be? But wh what I loved about it, listen to this part of her note. It says, the nurse next to me at the convention could not change anything on her person. She said, I don't understand the question. I thought how intriguing it was that we stand there paralyzed. I mean, here's the question. What are five things you could change instantly about yourself? And she stands there paralyzed. Everybody in the room changes something about their hair, taking off their shoes, taking off their name tag, whatever it might have been. She stands there going, now, what? I didn't understand the question. Because in her mind, it's too much. It's too much. I have a dear friend that says, you know what? I'm tired. I've changed enough. That this is the agenda on planet Earth that God, who came to work a wonder in us, will not cease until we see him face to face. Now, it'd been like that over 40 years. And so suddenly, of course, you didn't miss the part of the miracle that he jumps to his feet and begins to leap because it should have been that he was in maybe six solid months of rehab in order to even stand up, <laughs> let alone jump and leap. So we'd miss a great part of the miracle if we miss the fact that he literally jumps up and begins to leap and praise God, that God has given him not only his legs back, but strength of legs. It's a wonderful word, the word for leaping up in verse 8. If you look in verse 8 where it says, And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. That leaping up is a word that is, um, in Greek, the lexical word is uh, pronounced exalame, exalame. It even sounds like a wonderful word, exalame. It sounds like exalting, exalame. There's a word Ephalame, that just sounds just like it, only with a PH on it. Ephalame, there's exalame and ephalame. Ephalame means to leap upon someone. And I thought that would be much more awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> Have you ever just been so excited about something? Not only did you leap, but you leaped upon a person. That is the, the truest excitement of all. And, and it's, it's a rare word. And, and one of the commentators brought out that it is a word very much like the one in Hebrew when it says in Isaiah 35, verse 6, that the lame will leap like a deer. And that's exactly what was happening, was fulfilled in this moment. And it says something incredible in verse um, 11. It says after everyone recognized him and they knew he'd been the one sitting at the uh, beautiful gate. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. They were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And it says in verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. I want you to notice that he clung to Peter and John. And I mean, we get that completely. And you, you probably are um, already anticipating that is your third point. We've seen, first of all, that we're all begging for something. We've seen, secondly, sometimes we beg for the lesser thing we need. And three, sometimes we cling to people when it is Christ in them that attracted us. Sometimes we cling to people when truly it was Christ in them that did it for us. It was his spirit within them that attracted us. But we want so badly, we want in the worst way to cling to a person. Wouldn't you agree with that? And, and some of the devastation, many of us may feel greatly betrayed by someone who sort of unzipped or unvelcroed themselves from us because really their job was done, that season was done, and, and we were still clinging on and we feel betrayed by them instead of that it was for that season that God did such a wonder in our lives through them at that time. We, we want to cling to them for the rest of our lives. And I have found uh, that God has a very strange and wonderful way of so protecting his own glory, of so protecting his own uncontested status as savior, that whoever I make a false savior of, whoever I am clinging to instead of him, he will find a way over and over again to separate me from that person. Even if it's my own husband I'm trying to make into a personal savior. 
He'll do something that although we're in the same house together that I somehow feel separated from. I feel like I can't get from him exactly what I need from him. And I've got an attentive husband, but no one can become a savior for us. No one, we want them to in the worst way. We want to cling to them. We have such a tendency to do the same thing. I've got a story I'm just dying to tell you. And I've just, it has been like an ongoing saga. I can't tell you how many pictures I've got and how many times I've kept up on the story. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, my sister-in-law, I'm going to be telling you a, sister about, uh, a story about uh, my sister's-in-law, uh, Tina and Mary, my my husband has two sisters, and so they're both involved in the story, so it'll be a little bit confusing at first. My sister-in-law, Tina, the older of the two, has a cat. And a couple of months ago, the cat wandered in the house with something grotesque in its jaws. I mean, holding a creature that she flat out could not even identify. That is what it looked like. Can you... I mean, what in the world do you know? What is it? I mean, the first thing she thought is it's got to be a rat. But I mean, there was not a hair on it. Anybody got that with me? I mean, it was just kind of like hideous, just hideous. And so small. I've got another picture, but I thought, how, do you want me to bring a photo album or what? <laughs> you know, I, I thought um, it, it fit right in about half, literally half the palm of her hand. And so my oldest sister-in-law, Tina, was completely flipped out. I mean, she was like, what on earth is that? She was grossed out. She was also um, horrified because it's something, it, it, uh, she couldn't tell if it was dead or alive. And so she went over to try, and she was going, ee, 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 trying to pull it out of the cat's jaws because it was literally, look what the cat dragged in. You understand what I'm saying to you? I mean, it's in a very literal sense. So she gets it to drop it, and when it drops into her hand, it squirms just a touch. And she realizes that that thing is alive. Well, she is freaked. So she calls my other sister-in-law, whose name is Mary. Now, Mary has raised two boys. Don't nothing scare Mary. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. I mean, she just is that kind of person. And of course, Tina knew that when she called her. So she calls Mary and Mary says, I want it. She goes, what is it? She goes, I don't know what it is. <laughs> well, so Mary comes over to Tina's house and looks at it. And I mean, she's like flabbergasted too. At this point, it's still alive, but they know they're on borrowed time because whatever it is, it's new. It is a newborn something. So Mary takes the thing, gets online, prepares to go to the vet, whatever she's going to have to, gets online and figures out that it is a baby squirrel. Some of you are probably already on to that. And, and she realizes that she's got a baby squirrel in her hand and what in the world is she to do with it? And she said, well, we got to save it. She said, you save it. <laughs> so Mary takes the thing home. She gets online and she finds that in such a case, this is, you've know, heard of rescue dogs, this is a rescue squirrel. Because what she does then, she gets online to see what you can do, and would you believe there is canned cat milk? That's what you feed a newborn squirrel if you're rescuing it. I ask you not to think any of that through. <laughs> I don't know how it's canned. I don't know how. Don't ask me questions I don't know the answers to. I don't know how you can it. I'm just saying it's canned. That's all I'm saying. So she feeds it with a dropper. Well, she's shocked that it lives through the first 24 hours, and she's learned how she has to keep it warm. And uh, she does all the instructions meticulously. Every little thing, well, would you believe the thing really starts squirming around? I mean, it lives the second day, it lives the third day, it lives, lives the fourth day, it lives the fifth day, and this squirrel lives. It lives until it becomes, I cannot wait for you to see this. This is the picture, because I'm constantly sending it to her. Is that, y'all, tell me that is not the cutest thing you have ever seen. I mean, that is, look at it. I mean, don't you, don't you wish it had some eyes? I mean, that, I just want you to see. Can you stand it? Can you even stand it? That's it now. Now, let, let me tell you something about this squirrel. This squirrel, she thought it was a boy. She named it Rocky, of course. <laughs> of course she did. 
Uh, she was having to have a lot of imagination otherwise with the canned cat's milk. So <laughs> let, let's go with the easiest name for a squirrel. You name a squirrel Rocky. Only then she found out it was a girl and so it became Raquel. Raquel <laughs> the squirrel. Only, so now it really like, it's almost grown. And so she's been trying to teach it. It's so hard for a human to teach a squirrel how to eat an acorn. It's just a certain <laughs> thing. She's tried to teach it how to pick a pecan out of a shell. I can't tell you what my sister-in-law has been through with this squirrel. But it will go outside. This is the part I want you to hear because you're wondering, what on earth does this have? I realize that. I realize it. And I had to work hard to make it fit because I just love the story. <laughs> she puts it outside and it just lo it loves the tree. So she was so thrilled. It runs up the tree and she's like, Bye, little squirrel, bye, little squirrel. Down it comes, back up her leg, all the way and sits right on her shoulder. No matter how many times she sets that squirrel out, it comes right back to her, crawls right back up, and sits right on that shoulder. Now, one of these days, it's going to pierce her ear in a very big way because they are very sharp of teeth. That's what she's trying to figure out. But you see, it brought her something that she could work on until it was healed of its infirmity. And now it wants to cling in the very worst way, the very worst way. But it will be the death of it because its life is out there, out there. Go get your acorns. That's what you were born for. Go scurry with the other squirrels. It's what you were born for. No, I'm going to cling with whoever it is I associate with feeling better. And we miss the whole point that it's Jesus of Nazareth and Him alone. I come with such gratitude to God for James and Betty Robinson. They are such tremendous people of God. And I not only love them and just have so much respect uh, for what they bring to the body of Christ, I also get a huge kick out of them. And I, I love them dearly. So I'm so grateful. Keith and I both love the privilege to serve with them. And I want to tell you something. On Wednesdays, we get this opportunity. This is the outreach that we do on Wednesdays. But somebody else on the other side of the world uh, doesn't even have clean water to drink. They can't even get their minds wrapped around weekly Bible study because they're trying to stay alive. There are people that don't have enough food to eat, and there are outreaches of life that are meeting those kinds of needs. So I love being part of a ministry that has a broad range perspective on the gospel of the living Christ. So thank you so much, not only for participating on Wednesdays, but in all the outreaches of life. We are so grateful, and may God bless you. Well, I not only want to say thanks to, uh, to Beth Moore, for the insight, but also to that wonderful friend who watched Beth and was moved. A wonderful friend. I thank God for what Beth said about our mission programs and uh, the outreaches because they're not only a part of it having been to the mission field, but supporting it. But I want you to listen to what one of our friends said, a doctor who watched Beth and caught a vision that I pray you all catch. Listen closely. I found out about Life Outreach because I um, watched Wednesdays with Beth. And so that was something really important to me. And I've actually heard Beth Moore talk about her experience of going to Angola. And so I had been so impacted by that, um, those stories of, of the children and feeding and all those things. And I just started to feel like the Lord was leading me to join um, with them. Uh, to support Life Outreach and all the different ministries. The feeding and the water ministry just were extremely important. I think maybe because as a doctor, I constantly talk to people about what they're eating and drinking enough water, and it started to um, just really uh, weigh on my heart that there's people that don't have anything. You know, in America, we have so much to choose from, and there's so many toxic things that people can choose. and. Over there, there were just images of children that didn't have anything. And uh, it really pulls at my heart because I can see things now that I'm a mom with completely different eyes than I saw before. I know what it's like to have a baby depending on you to eat. And I, I've thought so many times actually since I had my child a couple of months ago that I, I can't imagine watching him suffer or watching him be hungry. 
And so that has spurred me on to just continue what I feel the Lord calling me to do um, in a much more emotional way, I think, because I feel connected to those moms who aren't able to do for their children what I can do for mine. I just broke my heart um, where I just felt like I've got to do something. If, even if I'll never meet them, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It, we're called to do that. I just feel like the Lord has, has blessed me in different ways and it's not, to, it's not for me that we're blessed. We're blessed to be a blessing. And that's what made so much sense to me is, is even if I can't go all the time overseas, then I can, I can partner with people who are already there and already doing amazing programs that are in place. And uh, that made a lot of sense to me. And that's certainly what I felt the Lord moving me to do. Wow. Lord, I, I can't tell you how much it blesses me. Uh, it doesn't surprise me because that wonderful, wonderful doctor who, who got spiritual food, you know, we tell you when we come and we share our guests or Betty and I share from our hearts or we have Beth Moore and she talked about who touched her. We're, we're trying to give you spiritual food and, and water. We're here to bless you, to give you life today, and encourage you to share and express life today every day. But when you hear a testimony like that, Betty, and you, you commented so many times how as a mother, you would never want to see our children or our grandchildren suffer. And yet that's where these people live. And, and we can alleviate their suffering and give them hope by simply giving them food. Absolutely, James. And, and one thing I appreciate in her sharing about her, her desire to be, a, to be a help to those, those babies that are in such need as she compares them with her baby and how beautiful her baby must be. But I think of it too, it, the mothers are the ones that touch my heart too because there's not a mother holding one of those babies that they wouldn't do everything they could to save their baby. And they do, but they don't have any options left. But we can help. We can make that difference. And you have so many, many times because you've, in your love, have reached out with Life Outreach to make the difference. We're asking you to do that again. Boy, you know, I know I've got a pretty tender heart. I, sometimes I find myself apologizing for it. I wish I wouldn't, but I, because uh, I, I can't help it, okay? I can't help it. <laughs> but when you were talking about those mothers and those babies, and, and I saw them being fed, and then I saw the one holding them, I, I felt like while you were talking, I guess I just felt like I heard a lot of mothers say, w would you help my baby? Many, many of them have no milk because they're malnourished and they, they can't even breastfeed. And uh, those mothers will say, would you help my baby? And I guess I hear Jesus say, would you give a cup of water? Would you give, would you give food? Would you do it to the least of these? I hear Jesus saying that to you right now, would you? Okay, would you? Would you help? Would you help her baby? You can. Uh, we'll always pray with you. Love pays for the phone call when you call. See, I got a broken heart. Okay, we want to pray with you. We care. We really care. We want to share your burden. But would you dial the number today and say, yes, I'll help your baby? A gift of $30. Think about it. This is incredible, but it's true. A gift of $30 feeds three children for the next several months. $30, three children for months. 50 will feed five, 100 will feed 10. We're gonna send the book that I've written to bless you, nearly everyone that knows me, and our son joined me in editing and helping with the book. He said, Dad, this will be the best seller you've ever written because he said everybody understands how precious their pets are but oftentimes they don't see the lessons God wants them to learn, and Dad, you put it out. And uh, we, we'll send this to say thank you for any gift, and I, and I hope you'll, you'll help all you can. And uh, then we're sending you Sarah Young's devotional Bible. This is absolutely beautiful. She's a missionary, beautiful devotionals, and this is a fabulous, beautifully bound, leather-bound Bible. Make the gift of $125. Help us feed 10 children. The lion and the lamb bronze for those of you who can make a $1,000 gift or more. And you know something? Some of you can do that. You could say a big yes to a lot of mothers for their children. Go to the phone, use your bank card like a check, or go lifetoday.org. You can do that and make your gift online. But make the gift God put on your heart. Would you do it? 
At this very moment, a child is drawing his last breath, struggling to stay alive due to a lack of food. Sadly, this impoverished child is not alone, and without our help, many like him face death as well. Today, you can make a difference. You can help save a life. Life's mission feeding teams are in place right now, ready to answer the hunger cries of 400,000 suffering children in remote areas of Africa. With previous food reserves gone and parts of Africa facing its worst food shortage in more than two decades, we desperately need to replenish our supplies immediately. Your life-saving gift of $30, $50, or $100 will help feed and care for three, five, or ten children for three full months. With your gift, we would like to send you James Robison's newest book, The God of All Creation. Through his personal observations of animals and wildlife, James shares heartwarming stories and spiritual lessons of God's love and grace. With your gift of $125 to help feed 10 children, you may request the new Jesus Calling Devotional Bible featuring 260 scripture insights from the author of the Jesus Calling Devotional, Sarah Young. Finally, please prayerfully consider a gift of $1,000 to help save the lives of 100 children. And you may also request the Lion and the Lamb Bronze Sculpture. Call, write, or make your gift online today. I want to say thank you for helping. I want to mention something. I know election week, you've got an opinion. We share direction. If you've not read Indivisible, for whoever leads in whatever position, whatever office in every state, every city, every community, and our nation, we need to know the direction to go. Get Indivisible. It's in the bookstores. We're sending the book the God of all creation, life lessons we learn from all God created, but especially from our pets. God shows us how much he loves us. And we're sending this to say thank you for helping us with whatever gift God puts on your heart. And then the other gifts, we want to just say from the bottom of our heart, thank you so much for letting people all over the world literally see the heart and the love of God by the expressions of love and what you enable us to give in their behalf. Thank you so much. God bless you for watching. Tomorrow on Life Today, Passion Conference founder, Louis Giglio. Lean back toward the generation that's coming. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.